and welcome to another course in the Mobile App Developer Academy. Today I'll show you how to utilize caching on the mobile device to boost performance of your apps, whether you're connected to a network or not. A strong pre-caching plan is critical to ensuring user expectations are met for speed and agility. And in this video, I'll be explaining three different strategies that can be employed to make your app hum, both on and offline. First, you'll see adaptive caching where after executing a document, its output is stored locally for offline use. Then, I'll demonstrate how to use subscription-based caching to push a local version onto the user's device, based on a schedule determined by a user in desktop or web. And finally, I'll configure my app for pre-caching so that upon opening the MicroStrategy app, any documents and supporting objects of my choosing automatically execute real-time and then store on the device. At first glance, it can be tough to sort out the differences between these three tactics, but a chance to see them in action should help you decide which one is the right fit for your business needs. Before we get started with examples though, let's make sure we clarify a couple of prerequisites and nail down a couple of the basics. Anytime we're working with a mobile device, it's important to remember all the steps between the underlying data and us. When we execute a report, as you may well know, our request goes from our device through the cellular network or Wi-Fi to the mobile server, iServer, and finally to the warehouse and back along the same path. When we talk about caching, we could be discussing a cache at any one of these levels. Your database may have materialized views, which are a lot like a cache at the database level. We have cubes, document, and result caches at the iServer level as well. There are element caches, object caches, and even database connection caches. In this video, however, I'm going to limit the discussion to just device caching, the type that stores all of the necessary information on the user's mobile client. Only with this type of cache can we support offline mode, ensuring that the user can open their app and access their data without the need for communication through the network or Wi-Fi. In addition, there are a few administrator-level settings accessed via MicroStrategy Desktop that should be configured appropriately for caching. In the Project Configuration, Caching, Result Creation tabs, you'll find a number of significant controls. In Creation, you'll find things like this checkbox for XML caching of XML and Flash document outputs. If you want documents cached and available for mobile, this box will need to be checked. On the next tab, the administrator can precisely define the amount of memory on the intelligence server dedicated to caching. More specifically, he or she can determine how much memory for specific types of caches. And if you'd like caches to reload on a server startup, here's the checkbox for that. In addition, the maintenance tab allows us to select an amount of time before caches are cleared out or invalidated. If our data updates daily, it may not make sense to let caches persist for a week. Control that type of option here. Finally, whenever we even start to think about caching, we have to remember the ever significant selector as a filter option. If you expect users to be able to load all of the data and easily switch between elements of a selector, make sure your selectors are formatted to not act as a filter. A filtering selector would be counterproductive in that it would return to the iServer for more information, the exact process you're likely looking to avoid with device caching. All right, now with that ironed out, we're ready to have a look at the first type of mobile device caching. Adaptive caching is the most straightforward. I open an app, I tap on what I want to see, and when I come back later, I no longer need contact with the mobile server, iServer, or database. I'm strictly operating within my device with the documents that are saved locally on disk. As an example, I'll open the homepage for my Superlink app. You can see that this Superlink actually holds links to other apps. Each of these icons will take me to a dummy app. I can tap on two of those to use an example. I tap on app group one and I open a nice looking home for another group of apps. And from here, I can open app one, which you can see is just a test document. Now first, it's easy to see that accessing these to the folder structure, I can read the words cached on and a particular date. 
That clearly means that when I reopen the document, it's actually just looking to the memory of the local iPad or mobile device to get the document. Now for the curveball, offline mode. I later open the app without any connection to Wi-Fi or a cellular network. To simulate that on my iPad emulator, hit the information button and manually switch on offline mode like so. All the uncached options are grayed out. You should know though that this is what happens by default if I open my app without a connection. Great news on two fronts. First, the folder structure grays out or puts in black what's unavailable or available, respectively based on what was cached by my prior navigation. I can still open app one by going into the folder for shell documents. And the kicker, when I open my app, which contains images as links to other documents, those document links light up or gray out based on what was previously opened. Pretty smooth, right? The link looks to the GUI ID of the document to determine whether the link should be grayed out. So don't worry about whether the way you're accessing the document is the same as the prior execution. So whether your business is making use of a home page or the default browse folders, adaptive caching will suit your needs. Now, back to the administrative perspective so we can see what settings made this possible. As an admin controlling the mobile configuration, we're driving the local storage settings for the user's devices. The end user has control over certain aspects, but as the admin, I drive the default behaviors. Thus, with the settings of the mobile configuration, I can determine caching specific properties like how often we validate the caches against what's on the server. Currently, my local device caches will check with the server to see if they're still valid every 600 seconds or 10 minutes. Since my server level settings have caching disabled, that actually implies that my device caches will be flushed out every 10 minutes. Cache folders might be an important option when using adaptive caching because my users may need the folder structure cache in order to access their document in offline mode. Thus, you can see that box is checked. And the last one I'll note for right now, clear caches on close. When the user closes the app, should the caches be erased or persist? Since my document use case, since my demo use case involves a need for offline mode and reaccessing the same document later, I've left that off. So that's adaptive caching, great for end user driven memory usage. It may make sense to employ this technique most often if your users are not predictable or consistent in the apps they run. We just give them what they already ran in memory. Now we'll move on to the next type of caching. Subscription-based caching allows end users' devices to be subscribed to a document and have it delivered for access later, whether in connected or offline modes. It's just like a newspaper being delivered to your door. You open the door by opening your app while connected to a network after delivery time, and the particular documents will be downloaded. A good image for subscription-based caching can be seen here. The subscriptions store on the intelligence server in the history list inbox at the time the schedule executes, and when the user logs in, the caches get pushed to the mobile device's cache. Creating a subscription is something simple enough for users to do themselves through the web, or alternatively, we can subscribe other users ourselves. I'll jump into web to subscribe myself. It's as easy as navigating to the document you wish to subscribe to, mousing over it, selecting subscription, and choosing your settings. I'll create a subscription to app too. Choose your user, your device type, and I can do myself a favor by checking the box that says run immediately. If you know the data is going to be updated every Sunday night, select Monday morning or another schedule made available by your administrator. I'll press OK and OK again. Now when I open my app, I download those documents and they're available on the reports pane where the check mark lets me know that they're already downloaded. That's because I've selected configuration settings that push the download to my device. With different admin options selected, I could make it so the cache is available on the iServer, but doesn't download to the user's device unless they select it from here. That might be useful if we have a bunch of subscriptions. Again, I'll make this more interesting by turning on offline mode just so you can see how this works and that it's not actually executing as I'm tapping on those documents. And there you go. 
Now, a couple of settings to keep in mind while you're preparing your environment for a subscription-based caching. Check for new subscriptions every however many seconds you decide. This means that your device will look back at the server and see if any subscriptions are waiting to be downloaded every five seconds. In production, you'll want to select a time that balances user requirements and network limitations, unlike this demo, just to show the subscription right away. By default, if there is a subscription prepared on the iServer, the user on the device will see it on the list of reports that I just demonstrated, but without the check marks to its right, implying that they can download the cache report from the iServer at will. However, in my demo, I check this box for automatically preload subscription so that users receive the subscribe reports on their device without pulling them down manually. That brings us to the third and final type of caching I'll cover on this video, pre-caching. Pre-caching allows us to execute and push specific documents onto the user's devices at the moment they open the app. Watch as I open my app for the loading bar that runs across the bottom of my iPad Watch as I open my app for the loading bar that runs across the bottom of my iPad when I open the app with this type of configuration. There, as the bar ran across, a set of documents were pre-caching on my device. But notice, I didn't create any subscriptions. If I close my app and reopen it in an offline mode, you'll see a set of documents preloaded, all the even numbers. Now, on the simulator, it looks like I'm still online, but I assure you I've disconnected the Wi-Fi of the machine running the simulator, meaning I'm effectively disconnected. The first difference between this and the subscription-based method is that the end user does not select the documents. Instead, it's up to the administrator to determine which documents pre-cache. The other big distinction is that these documents actually execute at the time of the app opening. Now, your other standard project caching settings still apply, but recall that subscription-based caching is always updated as of the subscription schedule. On the other hand, pre-caching allows for real-time execution at the time the app is opened. Since this is all controlled by the admin, let's go have a look at those admin settings. Before that demo, I actually reconfigured my app by selecting this specific configuration. The main controls for this type of caching are set on the home page tab. When you choose one of the latter two options for a default folder as your home page or a default document as your custom home page, you can select the pre-cache elements of a folder. More specifically, you can pre-cache any document and then associate a folder with it as supporting objects to be downloaded. For example, I can add a document like so. Then I go find the supporting objects, what folder might support it, for example, a document might have three data sets that it depends on. Make sure those supporting data sets all reside within one folder, and when selecting the document to pre-cache, select that folder as the supporting object folder. In this demo, you can see I didn't have to associate any supporting objects for the dummy apps, but that's only because these documents don't have any underlying reports. A helpful image for understanding pre-caching can be seen here. You can see the Corporate Request Center document is used as the home page, and then the admin chose to pre-cache each of these linked documents. Now, all of these four documents share a supporting objects folder. With that folder selected as a supporting objects, this app is ready to go. And that's a wrap for this Moda course on caching. I hope now you'll be more ready to line up a caching solution for your environment.